Previously on the Chronicles of Arsenal. <laughs> another year, another Arsenal preview. Let's see how poorly this ages. To begin this preview, let's start with our transfers. So far, there's not really been many exports, but that'll probably change the immediate moment this video comes out because that's just my luck. Austin Trusty, I believe, is on his way out to Sheffield United. Actually, I think that was confirmed just today. Last time I talked about him, I kind of slandered his name. I'm sorry about that. Two years after being at the worst MLS club in the existence of time, he's now a starting Premier League defender, so congratulations to him. During his loan spell at Birmingham City last season, he was exceptional, averaging 2.3 tackles and 1.5 interceptions per 90. Fuller and Balogun is another player that will probably be on his way out, and I don't really blame him. I don't know if he's going to get any kind of sufficient time if he were to stay at Arsenal, and he scored 21 goals for Vaughn last season. It's a bit of a shame but that's just how it is. What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? Hey guys, again, just a quick reminder. I got a new Twitter, and if you'd like to follow it for any video updates, all that kind of stuff, here is the handle, and there will also be a link in the description. Nicola Pepe has also been linked to a move out with recent interest being shown by Besiktas. Now, Nicola Pepe slander has been done on this channel, maybe a little too much. I couldn't even tell you how many times I've used that one single clip. But take away his agent who pulled off one of the greatest heists known to man, and I would say Pepe has been... he's been I. Ainsley Maitland-Niles, after a loan spell at Southampton, has been let go as a free agent. Honestly, I thought there would be enough to at least, I don't know, earn a permanent move to the Saints, but as a free agent, he'll probably get a move anyways. However, that didn't stop the Sun from throwing out their typical dog whistles. Pablo Maldini kind of an old nickname, so I might have to give you some context there. It's Pablo Mari. I'm just making a joke to anyone who wasn't there before. Anyways, though, he was loaned out to Italian club Monza to help them stay up, and they did just that. He played a massive role in that, and his story is even more badass when you remember the man was stabbed during the season and came back. I don't know what it is with our club. Midfielder becomes scapegoat, redeems themselves, and then immediately dips. It happened with the player that eliminated the throat goat all those years back, and now, Granite Xhaka. Xhaka's redemption story has been very heartwarming, but also a reminder that 50% of this fan base can go f themselves. And yes, I'm talking to the majority of Arsenal fan accounts on social media. Now, I had already been not too fond of Arsenal fan accounts on Twitter. Those are prime examples of what happens when you deprive yourself of the real world. Too scared to say a single sentence to your local cashier because you're too busy looking at Phil Foden's child's Instagram. Okay, let's get back on track. <laughs> Granite Xhaka was pretty underwhelming during his early Arsenal days and gradually fans started turning on him. And it was bound to happen because for whatever reason, us Arsenal fans gave this man seriously unrealistic expectations. We were kind of desperate for that leadership figure because at the time we were, you know, <laughs> relying on the likes of Mathieu Flamini and um, Francois Coquelin. And I kind of blame Arsenal's social media account as well for this and also the Bundesliga YouTube channel for this, but they kind of gave you this image of Granit Xhaka as the next Patrick Vieira. Already, that's enough pressure for a little youngling like Granit Xhaka, but it's even worse when Arsene Wenger can't even figure out what role best suits you. And this all led to the atomic bomb, dropped by Unai Emery himself, practically. Granit Xhaka had already become public enemy number one, the scapegoat of Arsenal's issues, and he gave him captaincy. <laughs> Man did not read the room at all and practically just turned Xhaka into one of those like wheels you see at the donor shops. And what followed was no surprise whatsoever. It's almost like this was bound to happen. During a game in October of 2019 against the Palace, Xhaka was subbed off and met with a choir of boos. And he responded by telling the crowd to f off. And I was 100% behind him that day. Before this day had come, Xhaka had not said a single bad thing about the club. Not one. The only crime he was committing was being underwhelming for the past few seasons, because he's never played in the right position. But on the opposite end, you had subhumans sending this man and his family death threats. Was Xhaka's way of responding to the boos maybe not the uh, professional way to do it? Sure. B but f 
professionalism in this case. Rent aside though, Xhaka could have quit there, but he didn't want the DGens to win. And once Arteta came in, we slowly saw Xhaka improve. He became more proficient with his passing during the early Arteta days, and finally, after multiple adjustments and a position change, he had his best ever season in 2022-23. And it was only poetic that in Xhaka's last game for the club, he scored twice in the first 14 minutes. Now at 29, he's back to the Bundesliga to play for Leverkusen, and all I can really say is, thank you, Granite. Now let's talk about our imports, and we're gonna start with one that is, um, it's interesting. One of our first signings in the window was 24-year-old Kai Havertz, an attacking midfielder from Chelsea for 75 million. A lot of questions have been asked about this transfer because... Let's let's not really beat around the bush. Havertz was trash last season. Kai's best season for Chelsea came in 21-22 when he scored 8 goals in 1,809 minutes after he switched to a striker. Not bad numbers, but last season he could only replicate the same amount of goals per 90 stat with an extra 700 minutes played. Now, it's easy to write the guy off, especially with all the low light compilations that have been created. But hear me out. We've been over Chelsea's volatile managerial changes in the past, it's almost as bad as the Saudi national team. If you look at the history since Havertz joined Chelsea, he's gone through five different managerial changes. And with that much change in such a short amount of time, no player is gonna thrive. Not one. And you saw that with not just Kai Havertz, but majority of Chelsea's players. They were terrible. But it was even worse for Kai, because he's been trying to figure out the position he's best suited for. And speaking of his position, the man doesn't even prefer striker. I know what you think. It's odd. The man plays up front for not only Chelsea, but his national team. But in an interview back in 2020, he told Marca his ideal position was as a number 8 role. And this was despite him at the time when he was at Leverkusen scoring the most goals at a striking position. Listen, okay, the price is bad either way, right? We're paying 5 million less than what Chelsea paid for him initially. But I think there's a lot that Kai can still provide for Arsenal. He's kind of like Saul in the way both players are good at a lot of things but don't excel in one particular attribute. Kai won't be the main man everyone relies on at the top, and he'll have more freedom in where he prefers to play, so I truly think Arteta can get the best of him over time. And this is 100% cope, I've been a Kai Havertz defender since his Leverkusen days, but hey, at least I'm not as delusional is this guy player that Kai Havertz is probably most comparable to and not in terms of ability but I've just worked it out okay I was I was thinking more Kaka both quite tall and languid but deceptively quite quick I think Arteta thinks that Kaka is the mold of player that Havertz could become. A big reason behind our bottle job was obviously our defense. It just didn't have any depth. But now we can breathe a little easier with the signing of 22-year-old Jurian Timber from Ajax. Timber has had praises sung about him by Dutch veterans like Daily Blind and even Virgil van Dijk. The right-footed center back excels with the ball at his feet, which plays perfectly into Arteta's emphasis on build-up play. Timber for Ajax was averaging 74 passes completed per 90, top 1% amongst all defenders in the next eight competitions. Now these are just small dinky passes. The man was averaging almost 9 progressive passes per 90. Again, top 1%. And if there's no one to pass to, Timber can widen his options by carrying the ball forward. He was in the top percentiles for carries, progressive carrying distance, and touches per 90. When it comes to defense, Timber only ever lost 0.21 challenges per 90, putting him in the top 9%. Arteta also sung the praises of Timber's versatility, and we saw that during the preseason match against Barcelona. A lot of fans have the impression that Yuri and Timber will just be kind of like like a backup center back, but I wouldn't be surprised if he really emerged into one of our main center backs as the season goes by. Finally, our last addition so far, Declan Rice. After a bidding war between Man City and Arsenal, we acquired the defensive midfielder for 116.6 million. He only averaged 0.5 challenges lost per 90, putting him in the top 4% of all midfielders. The 24-year-old also averaged 9 ball recoveries per 90, placing him top 1%. He's also got almost flawless anticipation on when exactly to step in and disrupt the play. Interceptions are a strong suit for him as he averaged nearly 2 per 90, putting him in the top 5%. And despite being a defensive midfielder on paper, 
skipper, Declan loves to progress forward. He had a progressive carrying distance of 134.5 yards per 90, which just barely misses out on the top 10%. One thing Arsenal fans will also really love about the guy is his tendency to switch up play. He's in the top 1% for switches per 90. Midfield depth was also lacking, so the addition of Declan Rice as Granite Jock at the parts is massive. Whether we see Declan play as a sole anchor or in a double pivot, we'll just have to see. But either way, I am super excited to watch Declan Rice this year. Alright, transfer is over, let's briefly go over preseason. We kicked off against Nuremberg and had a bit of a slow start, but it's just the first game, so whatever. Next was the MLS All-Star Weekend in the nation's capital. Kai Havertz became a meme with his volleys, and then we destroyed the MLS All-Stars 5-0, wearing the biggest abominations known to man. For the next friendly, Arsenal would travel to New Jersey to play Manchester United. I was actually visiting New York City the weekend that Arsenal were playing. I didn't go to the game though. Instead, I went to Chinatown with the Z Meister, where uh, I was fighting for my life. Oh, and let me show you what I got while I was in New York City. Boom, look at that. Look, look how beautiful that is. I don't even have a f***ing vinyl player. We lost the game 2-0, but honestly, I was too busy focused on the clips of fans fighting. Reminder, this was a preseason match. However, Arsenal bounced back in a friendly against Barcelona, set in LA, and then we won the Emirates Cup on penalties. Pretty straightforward stuff. Now, I know we're in the Community Shield, but that hasn't actually been played out yet, so, um... Future me, just add uh, some kind of reaction meme. Let's go, baby, we're winning it all! Now with that out of the way, it is time to preview the entire squad. I'm gonna start with defense because, honestly, it's like being a kid in a candy store. Saliba, Gabrielle, White, Tomogotsu, Timber, Kivior, and Holding are all either predominantly center backs or can play center back pretty well. And then there's Alexander Zinchenko who absolutely revolutionized the way we played from the back last season. I cannot stress this enough. There are so many different combinations for our back four. It's like we're Man City. And then you remember in front of all this is Declan Rice. I'm just, I'm just living in heaven right now. Other options in midfield include Jorginho, who has some very valuable range in his passes. He's within the top 5% of all midfielders for medium range passes completed with 26 per 90. The Italian also averages 7.3 passes into the final third per 90, putting him in the top 7%. He can be a little bit of a liability in defense, but that can easily be taken care of with a double pivot. Or there is someone else that I have previously talked about on the channel, but you probably don't know because that was during a time when I only only had 7,000 subscribers. Charlie Patino. During his time at Blackpool in the championship, he excelled. Blackpool were one of the lowest holders of possession, so these numbers are definitely a little bit weighted, but Patino was averaging almost two interceptions and blocks per 90, putting him within the top 10% of midfielders in the next eight competitions. The midfielder even bagged two goals and four assists for himself. If Patino stays at Arsenal, I guarantee you, you will be very impressed when he makes his debut. Now we've talked about depth in defense, how about we talk about depth in goalkeeping? This is not the arsenal I knew like four years ago. Now moving up the pitch a bit more, we have our attacking midfielders. Fabio Vieira comes back for his second season and I'm hoping for a little bit more because he, he wasn't really that great. Oh and also, Croydon De Bruyne is back, that's a wonderful sight to see, hopefully we keep him. An injury kept him out for a long time in the last campaign, but the season prior he scored 10 goals. And Emile Smith-Rowe can also play on the wings. Kai Havertz we've talked a lot about already, I'm just hoping he gets utilized mostly as a number. Eight. And in front of all these guys, we have the 24-year-old sex god himself, Martin Odegaard. Last year, he was undoubtedly our best player of the season. 15 goals and 7 assists, and honestly, he probably should have had more assists. But we'll get to our finishing issues later. Odegaard averaged 0.24 expected assists per 90, top 3%. 2.27 key passes per 90, top 4%. 2.67 passes into the penalty area, top 1%. 0.72 through balls per 90, top 2%. And nearly 5 shot creating actions per 90, you guessed it, top 1%. Besides Kevin De Bruyne, who I would say is better than Martin Odegaard, not a single other creator comes even close. Watching Odegaard play is like sitting down, hitting play on a song, and once the first couple of notes hit, you just relax 
exhale a little bit, and are sent into the Songs world. Then we go to our wingers, who had fantastic campaigns last season. Reese Nelson was like our Walmart Origi, he's the clutch type of player we had off the bench. Three goals and two assists in 11 games, none of which he started. Leandro Trossard may look more sleepless than your average East Asian worker, but I was sleeping well knowing this man was dishing out assists like mid-filet service. Ten assists in under a thousand minutes played, that's almost an assist every 90 minutes. Now in all fairness, Trossard was subbed in pretty late in some of these games, but still, that is an insane figure. Then there's the even bigger guns, and we'll start with Gabriel Martinelli. 15 goals and 5 assists. When this man is confident, the world bows down at his feet. And between mid-February to late April, we saw just that. In 12 games during that stretch, he averaged a goal involvement every 109 minutes. He's only 22, by the way, so there's plenty of room for improvement, and I fully expect an even better performance this season. Of course, though, our main winger is the one and only star boy, Bukayo Saka. A man so humble that it's almost suspicious. 14 goals goals and 11 assists, and he's only 21. The moment this man puts a foot on the ball, you know he's about to chef it up like Anton Ego is coming for a visit. Okay, well, at least for three-fourths of the season. Despite him being so good, he is still very young, showed that inexperience, and when the world needed him most, he vanished. But he will learn from his mistakes, and this year we could see a monster behind that smile. Finally, we have our strikers, and... <laughs> I, I don't really know what to think, it's kinda iffy. Eddie Nketiah only has so much time to prove whether or not he can take the helm. We've been over his exceptional positioning, but he really needs to improve his finishing, otherwise I, I just don't think it's gonna work out. And Gabriel Jesus, the man was exceptional on and off the ball, but the moment he had the job of finishing it, oh dear lord. <laughs> Listen, 11 goals is still great, but he should have had way more. In fact, stats back this up because Gabriel Jesus underperformed his XG by three whole goals. But don't get me wrong, I still love Jesus because he provides a lot more than your average striker. Whether that's him dropping deep and opening channels for Saka and Martinelli or any other attacking player, or his ability just to really freestyle around defenders and open space that way. Oh yeah, also almost forgot to mention this. Jesus just recently got injured, so he'll probably miss the Community Shield and our opening match. And that's when we kind of go into death, which I... Again, I just, I don't really know. There is Kai Havertz, but preferably I don't want to think about that. So we'll go to our next option, which I think is probably our best bet in terms of backup strikers. Ironically, Leandro Trossard. Trossard played up front while Jesus was injured, and I'd say he did a pretty decent job. Like I said, finishing is a little bit of a concern, but I don't think we need to worry about it too much. We already have plenty of goal scorers, and not to mention, we're like Man City too, we just try and walk the ball into the goal. Going into the season, despite bottling, I'd say the team is still at a pretty high morale. Mikel Arteta is instilling the family vibes in the club with ever-growing success. Speaking of Arteta, according to a bunch of articles, it is said that he's put in a lot of work in his tactics as of recent. The manager is trying to develop new ideas, that way Arsenal aren't as predictable as last season. We made the least amount of changes to the lineup of any other club in the Premier League, and as a result, teams knew exactly what to expect. Our playstyle was still effective, but you could see a gradual decline throughout February to the end of the season, where we of course bottled it. So with more variety in the way we play, it can really help our chances of winning the title this year. Expectations this season? Well, I'd say, um... Definitely title contenders. I'm not gonna tell you where exactly I'm putting Arsenal just yet because I, I don't even know myself. Uh, we'll save that for the Premier League predictions video. But we also have Champions League football, you know, I kind of completely forgot to mention that throughout the entire video. You know, it's kind of sad to say, but it had been so many years that I honestly had just been so used to only being in the Europa League. But Champions League expectations. Um, I think we have really good depth. So I would say around a 16. Well, we're not being the curse. We're not being the allegations. Domestic cup-wise, um... I don't know, man. Those those are so hard to predict. That's the closest you get to March Madness. I'm not even gonna touch that. But that was the Arsenal preview. We'll see how all of this is when we do probably like a mid-season preview or whatever. We'll see. I mean, as the jinx god myself, I probably should avoid a mid-season preview just in case. But of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janos Balash, Stin, Milioe009, Adnazir Makalankom, Aldipu, Alex Rod, Arai San, Carlos Anaya, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Joao Cavallo, 
Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, Retired Fire, Rory Byrne, Slider Kid, Sniffers, Taco Okafan, Tomakis, Victor, Chris Damaseno, Chris Visconti, Q Snaggy Champs 2022, Dominic Griffin, Emmett Shea, Lewis, Joe Paricio, Lucian Von Kreuz, Michael Nista, Nish, Patrick Barley, Rowan Cookie, Sylvia Citrus, Subscribe to Tim Day Tim, Unbroken Persona, and Valencia. 14. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like, follow my TikTok, trying to get to 20,000 there, and of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.